Welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here. Super excited. This is the uh, keynote event for us, uh, the Pittsburgh chapter of Informs. We're super excited about it, super excited to have everybody here. Uh, my name's Chris Villey. I'm going to kick us off. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Marcus, you want to give me a thumbs up? Okay, good. And let me just give a little introduction, and we're going to have some of the leadership team uh, speak as well. So, I'm going to turn it over to Annie. She's going to start us off. So I recognize a lot of names of those of you joining us today. So I'm sure that you know a little something about INFORMS, but it is an acronym for Institute for Operations Research and the Management and Management Sciences. Uh, the Pittsburgh chapter in particular is really focusing on connecting analytics professionals in our region. Um, and that's why the vast majority of you are here today. And we're trying to bring as much... <clears throat> content as we can to you. Um, Chris, if you can switch the slide, I'll just give a brief introduction of those of us that you can see on camera here. Um, you will see that the vast majority of us, there's a lot of diversity in terms of what we do. There's a lot of diversity in terms of our educational background. Um, I'm just always happy to not be the only one without a PhD on the slide. So um, we have Miguel, who you can see, he's going he's gonna to talk to you in a, in, in a moment here. Um, and then we have Harris, uh, Miguel and Harris have joined us and we're hoping to transition them into leadership roles here in the short term. Um, they already know that, but I'm just gonna say it in front of a larger crowd so they really know it. Um, Yash can't be with us today. He's our president and one of our founding members, uh, Marcus as well. Uh, and then Chris and I, treasurer and secretary. So we appreciate you being with us today. We're very excited for you guys to meet and get to know Steve. Um, and I will pass the baton to Miguel. Hey, thank you. So I'm gonna share our program goals. We basically want to encourage interest and discussions in the analytics field. Uh, as you can see, many different fields like operations research, data science, statistics, any, anything in, in, in analytics. Uh, we want also to present a forum for speakers and panelists like this one uh, to encourage discussion and, you know, and also to provide a means for networking and opportunities for communication for people that has the same interest like us. All right, so as you can see from the slide, we have a lot of exciting events planned or at least ideas for events. We're always looking for feedback from our community on what topics you'd like to, to have us you know, discuss or, or um, you know, address. So um, if, if you have any preferences here, if you see anything that you're really excited about, please feel free to reach out to us. Otherwise, we'll most likely have a happy hour pretty soon and then, uh, you know, continue to organize another larger event. Hi, this is Harris. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about uh, member benefits. It's one of the newest members of um, Informs. It's really meant a great deal to me uh, to find a community like this that's so welcoming and inclusive um, from, from such a broad uh, spectrum of people in the um, operations research fields. Um, I've already gotten a lot of reward out of being part of Informs just through um, the showcases, meeting graduate students, serious professionals, um, and, and having a drink with colleagues. Um, I really encourage you, no matter where you are in your informs spectrum journey, uh, to to give this a shot. Um, it's just been a really rewarding community to be a part of, and I'm glad to see you all here today. Thank you. Well, with that uh, intro and, and opening, and, and just to give you a sense of who we are and what we're about, and we, we talk about being a Pittsburgh chapter, and yet this is a virtual event, we're, we're all over the place, but we're thankful uh, to be able to be together. And I'm super thankful and super excited to introduce Steve to you. And Steve's gonna tell you a little bit about himself in a minute, but I can say that uh, Steve and I have known each other for a while, we've worked together, uh, really enjoyed interacting with Steve, really enjoyed working with him. He's a great guy, uh, he's a good speaker, and he's got really interesting uh, experience, really interesting ideas and thoughts. So what you're going to hear today, you're going to really enjoy. You're going to you're going to find it relevant. You're going to find it impactful. You're going to find it meaningful. And um, I won't read the things off of the slide here because you you've I'm sure already read it as you've seen uh, the listing for this. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Steve, turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, thanks, Pittsburgh. I need to my as you can see from my um, fantasy background, my heart is in Burgundy, but actually I'm in a hotel room in uh, Portland, Oregon. Normally I hang my hat at the Princeton, but this is my bio slide. Um, um, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Princeton Consultants. 
tell you about that. I've been uh, also a very enthusiastic um, uh, member of Informers for many years. I come at it from the industry side, and uh, uh, many of us congregate in a group called the Informers Roundtable. Um, if, if those of you uh, on this call are a practitioner, uh, I assume many of you are, and uh, you have not heard of the Roundtable, definitely uh, check into it. It's, it's quite a great organization. Um, this is a one-sider on our company. We are a boutique consulting firm specializing in AI and optimization. Uh, we've been in business for 42 years. We do both the software side and the analytics side. Uh, here's some logo examples of the different industries we're in, uh, quite a, a wide variety. I think one of the cool things about what we do on the technical side is that it works pretty much in every uh, organization, large and small. A little bit of deep drill uh, into the transportation industry. Um, we've worked for uh, lots of different carriers and uh, different modes. Uh, uh, FedEx Grounds, where um, uh, Chris and I have worked together. Um, a lot of people are of the opinion that you have to pick one of these rectangles. And and one of the cool, like I said, the cool thing about our stuff is it works all over the place. Um, we also do a lot of work in the freight railroad industry. Um, and, and, and uh, also suppliers, and then the shippers who use all these modes of transportation. And the reason I'm trying to show this is to show that while there's a lot of diversity here, pretty much everyone is asking for the same thing, which is to optimize their network. I want to talk a little bit, of, I have one slide talk about what, what we mean when we say optimize, but um, in plain English, it's you know improving service and costs and asset utilization, um, and, but, but other things that stakeholders care about. Uh, this is a one slide on our company, what we do. Um, uh, we do the full development life cycle. We often work with um, OR groups and uh, help them with their models or provide uh, third party advice on what the best practices are for their industry. And that's a little bit of this, um, the, the motivation for this talk. I hope there's some value. Um, I uh, wrote a book on optimization in 2011. Um, and uh, uh, I, I want to share with you a couple uh, slides from that. Um, this is how we um, use the term optimization uh, in terms of positioning it against uh, advanced analytics and artificial intelligence. I think this is correct, but I'll take um, um, complete uh, responsibility if this is not how you, uh, those of you use it. Um, we think of optimization as a subset of artificial intelligence. So it's not either or. Um, you notice that none of these things say machine learning or math programming. Uh, so we, we think of optimization as artificial intelligence that makes recommendations. Um, I, I'll admit that uh, chat, uh, GPT and others blur this a little bit, but I would say whenever it's against generation, when it's generative, that is essentially a recommendation. Maybe the term recommendation is a little bit too narrow for that, but uh, uh, general AI that is not optimization, uh, very clever programs, uh, finding patterns, um, um, classifying, but not really telling you what to do about it or doing it for you. And I think optimization is that subset of AI that is making affirmative recommendations and sometimes writing your homework for you. So maybe it's creating your schedule, maybe it's writing your homework, or maybe it's saying, you know, I would do this, not that, but that's, that's what makes optimization. Um, being a little bit more specific, um, uh, one more slide. We say, think about um, your organization has lots of different assets. We put the little double quotes around the assets because we don't mean assets the way I guess a CPA would or, or gap. We mean things of value that you have some control over. So the people in your organization, uh, the employees, the vendors that you work with, your customers or shoppers, they don't appear on your balance sheet. So they're not financial assets, but they're sometimes the most important assets you have is maybe your customer base or your people and, and various other categories of assets that you have some control over. And then there are often multiple decisions. Occasionally, it's a single decision and a single asset, but frequently it's several different assets simultaneously and several decisions that you're making. And basically, optimization is um, making multiple decisions uh, on multiple asset classes and making affirmative recommendations. The business reason to do this is, yes, efficiency, but not just efficiency. There's effectiveness, there's nimbleness, there's consistency. And of course, it, it nets out the profitability. So efficiency is different than profitability in that efficiency is generally considered a short-term measure. 
whereas profitability, uh, I think it is properly understood, is a long-term measure. So when you think of the total value of uh, this, uh, the value of a customer of a lifetime, you're often thinking of a profitability measure. Efficiency is often, um, you know, we've got these tasks or these customers to serve this week, today, uh, right now. What's the most efficient way of doing that? So there is a, quite an overlap between these different categories, but they do have a distinctive uh, flavor to them. So this is, I think a lot of you on, on this uh, webinar have seen variations of this. Let me just say something a little bit provocative or start with something provocative, if you'll allow me to. So optimization, uh, AI, whatever you want to call it, if, if it's such a fantastic brainer, no brainer, uh, why isn't everyone using it already? Whereas one might argue that um, large language models have just emerged into the sunshine. Uh, certainly uh, optimization has been, can be traced back to the 1950s. Um, uh, simplex method is quite old. It can produce a mathematically perfect schedule or assignment. So if you can literally take this magic pill and get optimization, uh, why isn't everyone using it? Why is it such a niche? But two examples that I want to just, I, I want to tease you with, and I'm going to talk about them at the end of my talk. Uh, these are two clients. I prefer to obfuscate them a bit, but one is a healthcare system a very large healthcare system. They have over 2,000 facilities in North America. And at each one of those facilities, the uh, person in charge of scheduling uh, schedules by hand. They schedule the patients and the staff by hand and generally using Excel. Another example, uh, the United States Census, which has hundreds of thousands of field personnel to uh, schedule themselves up into this last census. They basically would um, literally give each of the enumerators a, um, a folder, a binder full of different households, and they say, schedule yourself. So the question I wanted to ask somewhat provocatively is, if we can solve these problems and have been able to, uh, for decades, to optimality, uh, why are still, you see so much Excel and so much, so much um, you know, head systems in 2023, 2022, 2024? And I think the reason is because um, deploying AI into production takes hard work. It's not a magic pill. It's more like a, um, uh, something you have to work at hard. And I, I like to expand on that a little bit. And I have a few slides that show about the, um, our view of the life cycle of optimization. And I think that uh, a lot of people, particularly those with, a, with an academic background, um, they don't necessarily see that um, there's a whole lot of difference between the proof of concept and the outcomes they're trying to achieve. Whereas our view is that the hard part of getting a really promising proof of concept to the outcomes is the work in the middle. And that's really the motivation behind this talk. So thinking about differently and being a little bit more systematic, um, let's think two basic um, phases. So the proof of concept is the result of what you might call the discovery or the exploration phase. There's a business problem, you have data and algorithms, and then you organize findings. And, and at the end, you have um, uh, proof of concept. If you have it running someplace, call it an insight. And you say, hey, we can really make a strong impact on the, on the quality of the decisions, the efficiency, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, but as I sort of alluded to a little bit earlier, our view is, okay, you're half done, but maybe on the journey, you might be 10% uh, of the way done. The reason that, that optimization is not found more than it is, is because I think a lot of things have great proof of concepts, great insights, but they have trouble in the next half. The next half uh, might call deployment. So exploration, exploitation, this is the exploitation phase. So we have to basically take what looked promising as a proof of concept and validate it and design. For example, it might be that the researcher uh, collected a bunch of data sets and hand cleaned the data sets. Uh, most of us in on this call, I've done that um, and are still doing it. But in production, there's no researcher to sit there clean the data sets. You have to write programs or something that, that clean the data. Otherwise, sometimes the results aren't working. There is the product construction of the user experience, also integration with production systems. And finally, there is the field installation, depending on whether it's a cluster of a small number of users in a corporate headquarters or maybe a large um, field implementation. Earlier, I talked about an organization with 2,000 health clinics spread across North America or um, 300,000 um, census workers. Um, uh, the training 
the support of that is, is a part of the successful deployment and it's a significant, um, significant challenge. So if, um, if there are deployment risks, and, and I would say there are, um, can they be systematically identified and managed? So if, if optimization is not a magic pill, it's a lot of hard work, is there a personal trainer that can help us get through and give us some tips? And more particularly, can we systematically identify and manage risks in our kinds of projects? And that is the motivation behind what we're calling the Princeton 20. Um, I want to basically tell you a couple things about this uh, uh, before I, I, I launch right into it. Um, I had two objections um, when I uh, started telling our firm a few years ago, we want to start sharing this in uh, forums like this. And the first objection was that we were sharing our secret sauce because we've used this on every one of our projects for the last 15 or 20 years. The second was that it was so specific to us that it wouldn't necessarily be valuable to outsiders. And um, I'm, I'm just gonna present vanilla the way we have it with, with those as possibilities. I don't worry about the secret sauce part, but it might be that a lot of this is fairly particular to us. And so at the end, I wanna discuss that a little bit. I guess my general view is that having a vocabulary and a methodology that uh, your organization uses to identify risk, um, feel free to take this and simplify it from 20 to five, from 20 to 25, change the categories, change the names, but I think you wanna have a system. Uh, and, and really that's, that's the, the main thing I'm trying to communicate. I will go through um, these categories very briefly just so you get an idea, um, but we're not saying that these are the categories that must work for everyone. The way we use it is that um, for each project we're, go we're going to do, um, we basically uh, walk through these 10 and we risk score them. Um, we either say it's a risk point, so, um, um, or it is, we also have uh, neutral and minus, I'll show you this, um, I'll, I'll show you each one of these topics and I'll give you an example of one. And before we even do the proposal, um, we'll often talk with our sponsor and ask, do they, um, do they see the project in the same way? Um, internally, this is also how we determine which staff are going to be assigned to which projects. For example, if the, um, if the risk points really are, um, are highly technical, then uh, we would put people that have the super heavy technical chops on it. If on the other hand, they're on the business side, might people that have more experience with the business uh, subject matter and, or ideally have built relationships with, uh, with the business people. Um, we also use um, our initial uh, risk scoring at, at the end of the project in two places. We have something called after action reviews and also staff performance reviews. And we look at how the project ends up in, in light of the, um, the identified risks up in front. Um, obviously, uh, sometimes the project goes swimmingly well, but it was a fairly easy project. Uh, other times the project goes swimmingly well, but it was a very difficult project coming in. I think that should reflect in people's performance reviews, not just, hey, at the end of the day, it's the outcome. It's, it's really um, how well did people mitigate the risk to achieve the outcome for the project, whether the client is internal or external. And finally, just for us, these um, buckets, these 20 risk categories are repository for us for stories, for tips. Um, for each of these, I have a one slide version and I have excerpted a few examples of the tips. I, I will admit that um, in our shop, the tips are very well understood. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, they're very jargony and very terse. So I might explain a couple of them, but given the, the format and the time, I'll just, I'll just do it to give you an example. But I, I wanna give you an example of, for each one of these, how we collect our techniques and we use the uh, organization of these 20 uh, risk um, points to uh, organize um, and remember uh, some of our, our learnings. Um, when we first started this, we didn't have 20. We, we've had 20 for quite a while now, but in the beginning, it, it, was, uh, it was about half the number and they were all technical. Um, and what we finally uh, realized was that um, we would sometimes have one general category, I think, about you know, uh, business. But uh, we, we found that the environmental factors, what we used to call business factors, are often um, more important than the technical factors. And at the end, I'm going to give you a couple examples. One where it was largely a technical challenge and the other was one of a business challenge. 
So the 10, the first 10 of the so-called environmental factors, a little bit euphemistic, but what we mean are, are factors that are not technical, they're on the business side. So for each of these uh, um, uh, risk factors, I have a slide. Uh, if you want one, uh, I'll contact um, um, Pittsburgh Informs or, uh, or us and we'll, we'll send you a copy of this deck for your own use. And my purpose uh, in this format is just to buzz them very quickly and not to uh, try to uh, teach them as we would in our in our, our shop. This would be a several day course, intro course in the house. And I'm trying to you know do this in 40 minutes, but I'll spend a tiny bit more time on the first one um, just to give you a flavor of what it is. So um, for each of these factors, there is a view that this is a, a um, increased risk. That's the red plus one, red being bad. <laughs> There's um, kind of a green, which is actually, it's a negative risk. We're in good shape. And blue is, it's neither a risk positive or negative. It's kind of a normal sound. And here's the first place where I like to say, this is very particular to our firm. Um, this is what we normally see. So for example, um, uh, as a consulting firm, we are occasionally, and it's wonderful. We are occasionally called in and they're just hitting the ball in the park. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, sometimes they're, they're heading you know, down the drain, that's really challenging or they're just starting up. But most usually in general, um, the, we are hired when someone is, is somewhat struggling out of performing. And that is, our, that is our typical engagement. You don't generally bring in consultants when you feel like everything is going swimmingly. And if you're just starting up, people tend to want to, you know, kind of you know, roll their own before they, they feel like they need it. So for us, blue is standard. If we were in an organization and we said, this, the business that we're working for, um, are they a startup or is this a new line of business? If the answer is yes, then we would consider that to be a, a risk point on this score because one of the problems is that while it's exciting, you don't really know a lot about how they want to run. And so that kind of conflates with our project as well. And so for each of these uh, circumstances, we would have different um, what we call mitigators and tell our teams ahead of time, here are some of the strategies that we can uh, work on to uh, address this particular risk. So let me quickly go on to the second one to give you an example. So there's a difference to us. Sometimes people in our field uh, in consulting talk about the client, and they kind of conflate a little bit. By the client, do you mean the client business? Or do you mean the client executive, the, the sponsor? And we, we frankly use the term client in both ways. The client is the person who's kind of in charge of hiring you and the client is also their organization, but they're different. Aren't they? So for us, the classic is that the person hiring us is a senior manager for the line of business users. That's very common for us. Um, uh, better than that, the negative risk would be not only the senior manager, they're actually the general manager of the line of business. They don't actually manage the staff, um, but they're maybe a general manager, maybe a CEO. That's awesome. And a risk is, and this happens a lot, the risk is that we're being hired not through the line of business, but through some um, service organization, maybe IT, R&D, analytics, et cetera. Now, why is that a risk? That's a risk because a lot of the users who we are all trying to help, they don't report up through the person, the group that we're working with. And so we have ways of thinking of that as risk. Now, by risk, we don't mean this project is, is, is doomed. We mean quite the opposite. We say, this is something we have to watch. Um, we have to make sure, pardon me, we have to make sure that um, we are um, building the project that users want and will use, not the, use, not the project that, say, IT thinks is, is the one that we should be building for them. So um, this is an elevated risk. Uh, business processes. Um, we'd like to have um, a consistent business processes. We understand that in general, our system will represent significant change. Maybe they're going from manual processes to more automated processes, but, but it's, it's, it's good when they all do things the same way. It is obviously a, um, a uh, advantage when um, they're not only they will establish consistent, but we're not actually going you know, to actually make a process change. We're going to be behind the, the scenes some, and it is a risk point in red when we have to establish really new processes, um, uh, often because everyone's doing things slightly differently. In the example I was alluding to where we have the health clinics and they're doing things in their own heads by hand, uh, each, each clinic is doing it their own way. And so the fact is, not only are we trying to make the, the process better, 
we're also trying to standardize it at the same time. And that is a, that's a, that's a risk. Um, uh, broadly speaking, do they have a decision support culture? Um, if the user organization has AI decision-making in production, uh, maybe not for adjacent upstream or downstream decision, but their culture has shown that AI works. That's a, that's a good thing for us. Um, it's even better, uh, the green, if it's used uh, for adjacent decisions. So for example, maybe they do a, um, um, they accept um, jobs or accept orders or, or something using AI. And now this is maybe a scheduling or a pricing or some kind of other assignment, but we're adjacent to something that's already uh, being used successfully, that's great. And uh, it is a risk when um, this part of the organization is um, unfamiliar with, with, uh, with AI in, in production. They, they, um, they don't necessarily doubt it, maybe they do doubt it, but they don't have production examples they can point to and say, this stuff works for us. The decision scope, um, uh, it is typical for us that the decision scope is generally undefined, but has fuzzy areas. Um, uh, for example, uh, you are being asked to schedule, but it's our job to also figure out um, the staffing level, where's the staffing level given, et cetera. Uh, of course, um, if, uh, if the project is to determine what is feasible, uh, that is a risk area that makes for great R&D. But when you get to deployment, if you say, hey, um, uh, we should have decided this earlier, this is, this is a risk. Um, key performance indicators. Uh, it is very typical for us that um, it's hard to find a large organization that doesn't have a uh, great uh, key performance indicators running around, but they might not necessarily be upon the quality of the decision that we're trying to um, use optimization for. It might be with the outcomes, but not with the quality of the decision. And it also might be that the actual decision has not been reported in such a way that we can replay it and see different versions of the, of, of the decision. A classic example might be um, perhaps you have a job scheduling application and um, people uh, call in and say, hey, can you handle this, this job? And if they're told no, we don't recapture the, the job because we told them no. So um, we don't really have a nice queue of jobs that we turn down that we can schedule in with an organization and say, see, you could have done all these extra jobs because we, we only have captured the ones that we've done. Um, um, the value proposition, um, often in our projects, uh, people enter into them with a certain amount of enthusiasm. Um, what keeps them focused is the, the business case, the value proposition. And um, uh, often the value is generally understood, but not easy to quantify. Um, if it is highly quantifiable, that's obviously terrific. And if the organization says, yeah, we want to put AI here or optimization or whatever you want to call it, simulation, um, but they don't really um, have a, a belief that there's value here. Uh, they want it to be proven to them. That, and that's a risk point. And obviously then you have to, um, as your mitigator, you have to make that an early deliverable of the project. You have to show honestly, um, what's the savings here, both in cost, but also in efficiency, um, you know, customer service. We have to make sure that that is clearly communicated. Uh, resource availability. A lot of times organizations um, have multiple change initiatives going on at the same time. And uh, if, if um, we're battling for resources with another organization, another initiative, then that is a risk point. And uh, similar, um, are we part of a larger organization? Uh, I'm sorry, a, a large uh, change initiative or are there other initiatives happening at the same time? And um, sometimes people will confuse our uh, project with other initiatives or there'll be competing resource questions. And so these are all things that we've just tried to identify and come up ahead of time with some strategies for, for mitigating them. Finally, uh, the user engagement. Um, as I mentioned earlier, are the users directly in the sponsor's control? Um, um, if, if sometimes the users are all employees or vendors under the sponsor's control, that's awesome. Often they're not directly under the sponsor's control, but they're very well understood. And occasionally we will have a project where um, the goal of the project is to attract new users. For example, if it's a B2C application um, and uh, that's a risk point because often the, uh, the people in-house in have certain theories of what's attractive to users, but they neither control them 
um, uh, uh, or necessarily have line of sight to them. So a lot of the project work is getting panels of candidate users um, in, in terms of the, the user experience design and making sure that we're designing not just for the expert user, but also for the broad middle user. So just very quickly, that was the, uh, the 10 business um, uh, cases. I'm going to go even faster through the technical ones. I'm just going to largely just, just scroll these, and I want to get to a couple of quick cases. Um, uh, I'd also like to encourage anyone who has a question, um, please feel free to put it in chat. I can't see the chat, but uh, the, the, um, uh, the leaders of the Pittsburgh group uh, are, are in chat, and feel free to unmute and ask me a question or put it in chat, and um, I'll also put some time at the end. I know I'm going very quickly, um, and I'll try to speed up actually even more. I'm not going to read through these 10 slides. I just want to explain what they are and just keep moving. A really great um, um, place to be is there's already an existing AI system, and we're a replacement. That's great because we can show um, the existing system uh, works. Um, it has the data it needs to work, and then we can be compared against it very, very uh, straightforwardly. Um, Often they have an AI system in place, but it's not used religiously or thoroughly. And uh, sometimes we're in a place where it's, a, it's just green field and that's, that's a risk. Uh, is the application itself novel? Uh, can they look at other organizations, not, maybe not in their company, but other uh, comp competitors that are using the same kind of system? Uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. If not, if this green field, on one hand, there's a lot of glory there, but there's also, it creates a project list. Um, are new technologies in play? Uh, I think this is uh, very easy to see in this current, uh, I think very justified, but very uh, fast changing, exciting area around uh, large language models. Uh, they're in a very fast evolution. So is our project depending upon harnessing something, uh, some technology that's moving very quickly? Um, uh, decision scoring, how well can we um, create a, uh, what an optimization might call an objective function. How, how well can we trade off different objectives? Um, similarly, the business logic underneath the, um, the system, um, are they static? Um, are they well understood? Um, or is there a part of the project to try to create consensus and codify rules and conditions? Um, the, the supplying decision data, the, the data that the decision will be made of, we're not asking, is it clean and perfect, because the answer to that is a quick no, but do we believe that it's digitally available and do we view that it's sufficiently clean to make a first cut decision, or is that is that going to be a, a problem as well? Um, uh, software tools, um, uh, whether that's the off-the-shelf um, uh, user experience tools, the uh, solver engines, um, the open source tools, uh, does the project team have, have the ability to use what they believe is, is, uh, is necessary as the project evolves or is on a prescribed list. Um, speed for us is always um, something that we like when uh, making the decision faster than the status quo is considered a positive um, benefit. That's uh, because a lot of our new uh, technologies, that's their superpowers and they're very, uh, very fast. Um, user experience, um, our projects, and maybe this is more unique to us, but in general, in this generation, it's a human in the loop um, decision, namely, um, there is a, someone who's responsible for making a decision, and we are a job aid that will help them make, hopefully, a better decision. We're not eliminating them. Um, um, we're basically enhancing them. Uh, and broadly speaking, um, uh, last question is, this organization, how mature is the organization in terms of deploying AI processes into production? Uh, um, are they um, experienced doing that? And they have a, a nice quality assurance and um, um, training and feedback and support loop, or is that, or, or is that something we're gonna have to flag to us? So anyhow, that's the, that's the, uh, the, the 20 factors. I know I went through that uh, very quickly. Um, I'd like to, um, um, uh, once again, mention how we use them and then give you a couple of quick cases and answer any questions you have. So as I mentioned when I started, I think that, um, it, it's not necessarily this particular list of 20, and it doesn't have to be 20, but having for your organization a consistent vocabulary 
and a framework communicating and trying to speak what is valuable. We tried to pick uh, for these 20 items things where um, it, it's somewhat of a fact, yes or no, um, uh, maybe not something you can measure with a, with a, you know, with a, a instrument, but you can say, hey, do they have other systems in this, in this organization that are doing optimization AI? Are they, are, are they successful? Like, yes or no? Are, are there other organizations, maybe some of the competitors, that have a tool like this? So even if they don't have one, they can look around. So you might have a, a tool that's saying, hey, this thing is helping with pricing. Uh, we, we tend to do it in our heads manually. We have all these Excel spreadsheets. But there's some of their competitors, larger and smaller, can, you, can they look and say, hey, these guys are using a tool like that and they're, they're successful with it. Um, that's a fact. And so we like to have things that um, uh, um, we think are impactful, ideally something that is more, uh, something that is less controversial about whether it's true or not. Um, now, because there are 20 factors and they're all yes or no, there are theoretically, um, you know, two of the 20th um, combinations, but we found there, there's often clusters or pad, uh, patterns. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of those, for example. Uh, uh, at, a, at a project level, we think this moves the planning conversation toward preventing problems uh, up front um, rather than um, hoping for the best and then uh, firefighting them as they go. But the extent that we can identify up front, look, um, we're going to have to just have to double up both in our staffing and our time frame on communicating with the business, the, the benefits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera or not, or, or, or just the opposite. They might say they're really interested in getting uh, an MVP in the production as quickly as possible. So let's really focus on that. The, the, the danger is that if we don't get a quick win, there are other initiatives that are fighting for the same headspace and we might get pushed to the back. So being able to say ahead of time, here's the risk points of this project um, and here's uh, how we're going to approach it with the mitigators that really helps uh, start the project and make it more successful. Um, as the project unfolds and there are problems, this also lets us um, focus on problem root causes. Just because we identified upfront some mitigators doesn't mean we've eliminated the risk. We've just basically said, here's some of our best tactics. So most likely, if we have problems during the project, most likely, if we're doing our job right with this risk scoring, it will be on one of the identified risk areas. Not necessarily, but in general, yes. So instead of saying to the practitioner, hey, what's up with this? We'd say, as we suspected, this is going to be a problem. And we're, we feel like we're not really vanquishing this. We've got to put some more uh, talent, more, um, more communication toward it. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we also use this to capture lessons learned. So anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we'll get through a project and we'll say, OK, um, uh, as we suspected, this was a risk. Or we didn't see this one coming. We should have focused it. But here's how we, we fought our way out of it. We're still standing, so we survived. Here's what we did to get out of it. This should be part of our kit, part of, part of our storytelling. So I want to give you two uh, quick examples of, of projects uh, that score. This is the healthcare one I mentioned earlier. So um, the status quo is they've got over 2,000 clinics so de developing a very large number of schedules. They're doing completely manual scheduling. And it's, it, it's obvious to everyone that there's a very high potential value if they could just put in a couple more patients, if they're not paying so much overtime, et cetera, et cetera. So the real, the real problems were on the technical side, not the environmental side. So um, the, the business was gung-ho, the sponsoring executive was gung-ho, very high level C organization, a very large organization. The value proposition was well known. They were saying, look, we've got all these uh, change management and operational improvement uh, resources. They're all uh, available to you. Um, uh, the business process was a risk because, as I mentioned earlier, each of the clinics did it their own way, and the, they didn't really do a good job of measuring the value of, of the um, particular decisions. They would just look, okay, so how much utilization do we get? But not, um, uh, did you make the right uh, decision? A lot of the problems were on the technical side, particularly around things like, uh, do we have the correct uh, data captured on a system? So if you're, school, if you're basically... Um, uh, scheduling in your head and you're doing it with Excel, maybe the uh, someone calling in sick is, is emailing you, maybe they're texting you, maybe they're calling on the phone. They may not be in both the HR system as a scheduled uh, holiday or vacation. It might be uh, just something you have to know in your head. Oh, they're saying, that, is there any way they can get off next next Friday and can someone swap with them? So a lot of the, um, a lot of the um, uh, 
from the risk in this area were on the, uh, on the technical side. By contrast, I mentioned that um, we helped optimize the 2020 census and the actual problem, uh, it was at a very large scale. So 350,000 uh, individual schedules every night, but the, um, uh, but, but doable, I, I would say, you know, not, not uh, crazy, no one's ever done this before. Uh, but there were many significant environmental factors. Um, um, uh, and I, I have a couple of slides just to give you a flavor of this. Um, uh, the people doing this counting are called the enumerators, they're counting. And every 10 years, you hire a few hundred thousand people and they go door to door. Uh, this was the, um, this is literally cut and paste out of the manual for the 2010 census. And um, the, the red highlighting is mine, but basically they're saying, um, if you're going to do this job, each week we're going to give you a list of addresses and you have to plan an efficient route of travel and you address you plan to visit today. So A, you have to decide, am I going to work today? B, which addresses do you think you're going to hit? And C, what's a good route for them? So it's not just a routing problem. It's also which, which houses do I think I, I, I should hit? So uh, for the 2020 census, uh, we uh, gave each um, enumerator a smartphone <laughs> instead of a binder. And we basically um, uh, gave them uh, optimization software that would assign them and route them uh, in real time. After each house, they, they, would, um, they would walk up to the house. Uh, it, would, it would set up a lat longitude. Um, it, and then they would, um, the numerator would be asked, so were they at home? And if so, did they agree to take the census? Uh, or, or if not, you know, you know, why did they say they, they wouldn't be able to take the census? An example of the reason might be they, they claim they don't speak English. Um, um, you hold up a card and they say we're, we're Spanish speakers. So uh, our follow-up is we're gonna send um, you know, a Spanish speaking enumerator as a follow-up. Now, sometimes to be honest with you, I guess they're suspicious they don't wanna to talk to someone. So they pretend they don't speak English. But anyhow, um, uh, this thing allowed us to, um, to capture this. And the next day, possibly they would see a Spanish speaking enumerator show up at their house um, and um, um, to create a lot of efficiencies. Um, uh, we, we got rid of a whole bunch of people that were putting together binders, lots of super, supervisors, and the basic uh, savings were um, huge. Um, so we were, uh, I'm happy to say, uh, 2022 as in won the words finalists. We did not win, uh, but it was a tough year, and we felt very proud that, uh, to be a finalist in this. So I just want to say, uh, in, in conclusion, that um, it, it is a magic pill. It is also a lot of work. So it's, it's both hard work and, um, and, and at the end of the rainbow, it can be uh, a game changer, it can be really fantastic. So I'd like to thank you. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, uh, two others that are um, co-authors of this presentation and lead practitioners, uh, uh, Irv Lustig and Patricia Randall, who if you hang out with forums, you'll, you'll see them. And, and uh, even though I, I gave this talk, um, I'm only one of the three co-authors I'd like to acknowledge and, uh, and thank them as well. So that's basically my presentation. Uh, thank you all for listening to it. Um, uh, I'm getting used to speaking on Zoom, although it's hard when you're not looking across a, um, a group of people to see whether um, you're going in too much detail or, or maybe your mic's not working well. But um, uh, thanks. Um, Chris, can I turn over to you guys and see if there's any questions that people have? Yeah, let's open it up to questions, and uh, we have a little bit of time left. If anybody would like to ask a question, uh, Harris. Hi. First of all, I just want to thank you so much. This was a, a fascinating presentation. Um, one question that I often have in these situations is for the non-data scientist clients, um, mm -hmm. how do you empower them with trust in the tools and the recommendations that they're making, um, so that they have a that, that that they have trust in the optimization, the the equation, the the output the, that these tools create. It's a great question. So um, some of the risk factors give you kind of our perspective on this. I'm not saying these are the answers, but so so if you can point to other things that have been successful in their own organization. Um, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that your stuff is good, but at least it, it gives them evidence that um, 
this kind of stuff works if done right. That's why we consider that to be a risk. If they can't point, you might have an organization that is a very sales oriented organization. It's people do things by the gut. It's all commission based. And there's not a lot of trust that any model can outperform their subject matter. That's a risk. And so that's a different path than if we say, look, um, a lot of what you do here, for example, you get all these leads that come in and you already have a piece of software that grades them into A's, B's, and C's, and that works pretty well. Um, so um, uh, just think of this as that same kind of software, but one step further. So if you have to do a sales call, and this thing is basically trying to tell you, you know, here's what we think you should be doing on the call, or here's, here's the likelihood this is a good week to call, um, think of it as the same kind of software. So it's, it's helpful. Uh, another example I was giving earlier, I just want to use this as another example. It's like, you may not be using anything here, but look at your other competitor. That, that, you know, you, you're the big fortune company. You're, you know, you're, you know, you're mighty, but look at this small competitor and they don't have anywhere near your reputation, but they're actually giving some of your people a run for the money, but they're using technology in a big way. And we should maybe be doing the same thing. They, they will have the best of both. They have our reputation, our scale, but also have the same tool as small guys using it. So sometimes it is by analogy and showing other uh, success on there is uh, when um, that's not available to you, then you do have to decompose the project and show um, um, the people that are going to make the decision if it's human or move, this thing is behaving uh, rationally, it's doing things the way you would do it, it's doing a lot faster and, and you know, checking a lot more choices. So then I hope that's a responsive answer. Yeah, I had a question in the Q&A. Um, so if you're a, an attendee, uh, you're not able to unmute. However, uh, we have a couple options. One is if, if you do want to speak out your question, I think I do have the ability to, to allow the unmute to happen. If you want to do that, we'll give it a try. Just raise your hand virtually and we'll do that. The second option is you can type your question in the q and I'll field that. And then I'll just ask it for you and uh, we could do it that way. So whatever you are more comfortable with, give that a shot. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir, Miguel. Hey, Steve, thanks Thanks a lot for the presentation. It was really cool. Um, from your experience, um, what's the, the percentage of the time when you get involved with a project like this, with a company uh, on getting the data, translated that data into your you know mathematical model uh, and then once you provide the optimization solution the, the analysis of the results and all this stuff so what what percent of the time um uh, is it sorry uh, yeah the, the time you spend on getting the data and translating that data into the mathematical problem and then once you have that i guess the analysis goes straight forward right but yeah, I think I get the question. So the way that I frame this presentation is very similar to the way that we are often hired. So I would guess that a lot of the people on this call do the first part of it, and that's where they get the most um, intellectual enjoyment. That is not how we're hired. So we are not, you know, say a censure, but we're closer to them than a lot of the people in this room are brilliant researchers. So usually when we're called in, um, the initial research has been done. So, the, so people say, we can marshal the data. Now, maybe we had to hand clean it and blah, blah, blah. But, but look, this thing was a game changer with the place we put it in. Now we need to scale it and, and get out of the field. And so um, the clock has, so maybe that took someone uh, six months. Maybe it took them six years of their life. You, you, know, you know what I'm saying? So, but that's not on our clock. Our clock is someone saying, okay, um, we're really going to go to the outside this time. We want to see this thing in the field. I mean, it's, we're all convinced that there's money here. Let's get, let's get that in. Sometimes it's for, it's for good reasons. Sometimes it's for um, CYA reasons. You know, we had this, um, I, I mentioned that we are in um, railroading. There was a terrible accident in railroading a generation ago. There was one and they said, there's something called positive train control. Where the, where the railroad can stop a train from the home office. Um, I, we need that in everywhere. And you have, you know, three years to do it. So sometimes it's a motivation like that. Um, that's not the greatest because people are looking for, um, it's, it's kind of like everyone's hiding and just like CYA and what's the, what else? we like it better when it's an competitive thing. But um, I would say that in general, um, uh, the amount of time it takes to roll out a proof of concept to the field, regardless of agile and stuff, 
maybe it's 10 times as much effort and time as initial insight, which is disappointing. You'd like to think that, that you know, the discovery is, 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 you know, is, is 90% of the value and the deployment is 10%. I'm not claiming the deployment is 10x the value. I'm just saying it's 10x the time and 10x the, the effort. You know, Joe, just to think a broad number, but it tends to, it tends to overwhelm. If you can do a rollout plan where you have a few, uh, you can take the one site that we worked at and maybe do a few early bell cow sites, do we like to call it? And, and you know, there's, a, there's an old story of um, uh, Tom Square whitewashing the fence. And, and the, if, you, if you remember the story from the grade school, he basically said, are you good enough to whitewash the fence? And people were begging to do it. So if you say, you know, corporate says this thing has to be installed by the end of the year, then you're kind of making everyone get out of a brush. But if you say, well, um, these guys got it and they're doing great. These guys got it. He was, hey, why, am I, why aren't I getting it? So there's a psych out way to get kind of a demand pulled around. Well, maybe the way to deploy it is to start with some early uh, field wins that, that people would say, wow, they're, they're getting a lot of value out of it. Why don't, how come they're the favorites once again? Why can't we get that deal? So Steve, a question for you, because I think it's very interesting how you open this up and talking about a lot of who you interact with out of the gate is maybe a startup who has specifically found an issue or a problem and they, they recognize they need to optimize it or a situation where the environment or something has changed and generally things have gone wrong. And so there's an organizational you know, awareness that, hey, we need to dive into this in a new way. Because I think, so I come from interacting with middle market companies and maybe even small to middle market companies where to your example of you just kind of set up your Excel spreadsheet with here's what the schedule has to look like, insert yourself into it and make it work. You have a lot of middle market companies that have been operating with that feel or that just very basic structure and they just fill things in and maneuver things very manually. Um, How do you get the call from that company who's been in existence for 20, 30, 40, 50 years that maybe doesn't even know that there's an opportunity to improve what they do. I think that's who I interact with most often. Um, And it's almost that situation where um, they don't even know what they don't know, to be honest. Um, How do you get those referrals? And what do you think about that kind of situation? Like what's, what's your entry point there? That's a great question. Um, that health clinic case that I was using, I need to keep it blind, but I don't think they would mind if I, if I use their name, but I choose not to. But they are really, I said there are over 2,000 clinics. They're, it's like having 2,000 small um, doctor's offices. So it is like a, a bunch of good market. It's not this Colossus Mayo Clinic type thing where you know it's all under one big schedule. So we definitely, we definitely see that. And I think that the things that um, the, the users in a small organization want are often uh, different than what a corporate buyer wants. Corporate buyers are usually very rational and want, show me a 6% or a 4% savings. I know how much we spend. I can multiply by 4% and, and see whether there's an ROI there. A lot of times in the mid-market, you're solving for things that are more about the fact that one person is doing four jobs. And when they're on vacation, the whole thing falls to, falls to crap. And so often it's like, imagine that we could automate this. We don't have to rely on one person who's our expert uh, pricer or scheduler or something. And, and so I think there are, it, it, all organizations uh, are, you know, what might say are rational, but I think they have different needs. And, and a lot of what our uh, stuff does for the mid-market company is more about uh, consistent automation and less about, you know, saving 4% or saving 5%. You actually do end up saving 4 or 5%, but I think what you want to lead with is something that is, you know, does it ever happen to you that it's it's uh, you, you you're trying to get home to, to your family? It's Friday afternoon, and then you get two more calls, and you have to stay an extra two hours to fix that. And you will say, "Yes, in fact, it just happened last week." He's like, "Well, well, imagine you had a tool that, that was doing this, and when people um, self schedule, like a, a staff member self schedules, it the, the thing just solves in the background." So I think there are different ways of you know of presenting the benefits, and I think the mid market company has got to be a lot more practical and a lot less uh, cerebral, a lot less, you don't lead with the finance space. For the large organization, you lead with the finance space or the, or the risk mitigation space. But I think for the, um, for the mid-market company, it's, it's more of a, um, a personnel thing and, and more of a lifestyle. 
I like, agree. And I, I agree, Steve. And I think sometimes it's even capturing just the customer experience, right. And, and, and kind of meeting their needs. Um, but maybe not recognizing the way to optimize meeting them. Um, I, I just think there's, I mean, I think your market is untapped in terms of those folks who don't even know that they should call you and know that you can be helpful to them. I'm just wondering how to, how to figure that out, but. Thanks, Annie. I, if I don't want to camping on to what you said, I, I, I quite agree with what you said. I mean, for example, you might say, um, so the current status quo is your customer is calling and they have a simple request. And if you're, if the person that they normally do business with or the customer experience person, if they're available immediately, they get served really, really well and quickly. But what if that person is not in today or not available, then they, they leave a message and then they have to kind of wait. So, you know, wouldn't you rather have something where they could get quick answers for routine things, um, which is maybe Pareto, maybe it's 80% of the time. Hey, mind if we change it from, from four to five o'clock or, you know, could you fit an extra person in or, you know, is it okay if I cancel? Yep, got you covered. Thank you. You know, that could be done with automation. And then it could triage and say, actually, um, I need to get a rep for you. And it's going to take me a little while to assemble it for you. But, but um, uh, we understand you're important and we'll get someone as soon as we can. But, th but sometimes the sale to a mid-market company is, you know, you don't have an infinite um, staff of headsets or, you know, you, you know, sometimes a customer is calling in and it takes you a while to get back to them. Maybe we should do something about that because you might be losing business to, to someone else. Well, I think this is a perfect uh, stopping point. It's, it's right on the hour. And uh, Steve, I just want to, again, say thank you very much. A really good, really intriguing talk. Uh, this, uh, this, this presentation was recorded, so it'll be posted out on the Inform site. And uh, hopefully everyone's really seen uh, a lot of value here and has got, gained something from it. I want to thank everybody again for attending and I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.